Hello out there, everyone. This is Ben from Cinema Gulp, and this is our Halloween edition of Fill in Vinyl. On this episode of Film and Vinyl, we're going to be covering the 1985 gore fest filled with awesome psychobilly and zombies. This is Dan O'Bannon's 1985 zombie film, Return of the Living Dead. There's a really nice parallel between the two facets of this film that I'm going to discuss. On one hand, the film Return of the Living Dead has a very steep hill to climb as a film. Coming out in 1985, it's easy to say that zombies weren't exactly topping the popularity charts when it came to horror. We were far past the groundbreaking George Romero revolutionary classic Night of the Living Dead and almost 20 years away from the films that reinvigorated the genre like 28 Days Later, The Dawn of the Dead remake, and of course, Shaun of the Dead. Zombie movies were the lowest common denominator, the bottom of the barrel, the forgotten era. People turned their heads to them, threw their noses up in the air at them. Long story short, they were not respected. As if all this wasn't enough to sink the movie, add in punk rock music, a completely repulsive, loud, and downright ignored music genre of the time, at least in the States. Sure, there were many great punk bands making waves in the early 80s, but when it came to Hollywood, it wasn't exactly the type of music you would load up a movie soundtrack with. Yes, there was the Strong Era where we saw the beginning of the New York punk rock scene from 1974 to 1981 with acts like Patti Smith and the New York Dolls, but by 1985, it was all but passed up by the Michael Jacksons and Talking Heads of the time. Still, punk rock influenced a ton of the music that would come in the following decades. When it reached the West Coast, it came in the form of your Black Flags, Dead Kennedys, Circle Jerks, TSOL, and Bad Religions. During this time, growing underneath the surface was Psychabilly, sometimes called Horrorbilly, which was a fusion of Rockabilly, Goth Rock, and at the forefront, Punk Rock, a recipe bred perfectly for horror. So with both the genre of the film and the music chosen for the film having not been ever mainstream at that point, director Dan O'Bannon was said to be out of his mind for taking on the project. Opening up fairly wide against both National Lampoon's European Vacation and the juggernaut that was Back to the Future, which was number one at the box office for 11 weeks that summer. Return opened up, well, really strong. It opened to $4.5 million, which was more than its entire budget. It went on to gross just over $14 million. A really good hit, especially for its R rating, which at one point was almost going to receive an X for its sex, nudity, violence, gore, intense sequences, and profanity. I mean, Lena Quigley is fully naked for basically the entire movie, even after becoming a zombie. Spoilers. Aside from becoming a big hit by 1980s horror standards, it was always a bigger critical sensation. It currently holds a 91% on Rotten Tomatoes, who stated, A punk take on the zombie genre, Return of the Living Dead injects a healthy dose of 1980s silliness to the flesh consuming. Though I tend to agree with the quote, I question the validity of Rotten Tomatoes in general. The film's legacy as not only a great zombie horror film, but also as a classic punk soundtrack is cemented in the culture for which it stems from. It has influenced horror films since its release, but also punk bands. The since disbanded British horror billy band Send More Paramedics took their name from the film. Send More Paramedics performing their shows dressed as zombies, and singing lyrics mostly referencing zombie films. The film was originally shot in 185 to 1, and audio recorded in mono. There have been several remasterings since, but from what I hear, some of them pull a George Lucas and mess with not only the music in the film, but change the pitch of some of the zombies' voices, including the film's MVP, Tar Man. It wasn't just the music of the film that was punk rock. It was even ballsier of O'Bannon to write the majority of the main cast protagonists as punks. We have characters named Suicide, Trash, Scuzz, and Spider. So in a way, the whole fucking movie is punk rock. So it was only fitting to add in some great punk music. O'Bannon directed the film as well as wrote the screenplay based off a story by John Russo who wrote the novel that it's loosely based on. O'Bannon got his start working with the legendary John Carpenter who he went to USC film school with and they worked on the film Dark Star together. He made his early living as a script doctor and even wrote a few stories for Heavy Metal Magazine. He was brought on to doctor the script for Return of the Living Dead that at the time was slated to be directed by Toby Hooper who eventually had to back out because of obligations to direct Life Force. So O'Bannon was offered the duties, which he happily accepted. Once he was on board, a lot of changes were made to the original Russo draft. Apparently, Russo's script was a much more serious take on the material, which was believed to be a direct sequel, 
to Night of the Living Dead. However, by the time O'Bannon was done with it, it had almost zero resemblance to the original story and novel, particularly a scene where a character, Frank, tells his new assistant the story of the events of the original Night of the Living Dead in an honorary attempt to link the two films together, if nothing more than to pay homage. Let me ask you a question, kid. Did you see that movie, Night of the Living Dead? Yeah, 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 that's the one where the corpses start eating the pupil, right? The film is considered one of the best zombie movies ever made, and I would have to agree. Not because it's super scary or intense, even though it is, more because it's the funnest time you will ever have watching a zombie movie where the world is about to end. It's self-contained, yes, but there's an underlining current that everything around the crazy, goofy hijinks that's going on, that much more of the world is in danger. It's undercut by the fun for which the film is approached, but it's there nonetheless. And the complete badass punk music plays a huge part in that. Ooh, baby, your this film is chocked full of great psychobilly tracks. Bud Carr, one of the industry's top talents in music supervision at the time, was recruited to work on with O'Bannon, and what they put together just made the film that much better. Carr would go on to become a very big name within the industry, becoming a frequent collaborator with Academy Award winner Oliver Stone on such films like Platoon, JFK, The Doors, Born on the Fourth of July, Natural Born Killers, and Any Given Sunday. Later in his career, he supervised the music for the underrated rock star and Get On Up, starring the late Chadwick Boseman. Carr and his team had only $10,000 and two weeks to put the soundtrack together. Bands that he already knew to be aficionados of the subgenre, like The Cramps, were easy picks. However, the song to open the film had to be so perfect that it had to fill out the music for a fairly long opening credit sequence and set the tone of the rest of the movie. Enter the main title by Francis Haynes, The Trioxin Theme. The Cramps, Surf and Dead, which first lays down the perfect Halloween dose of slow drum, is immediately ripped into with the late singer Lux Interior's ghoulish lyrics, Ah, my favorite brain soup. Ah, my favorite brain soup. That's then followed with guitarist Poison Ivy's dark, gothy guitar riff. The song is the movie, with the chorus line being, come on, do the dead. It helps feed to the audience exactly what type of movie this really is. And it plays very much like your classic Halloween song from the 50s or 60s, only it's punk rock and it's in a crazy fucking movie. This movie doesn't give a fuck. That's the best way to describe it. And the song tells that tale. 45 Graves Party Time, definitely more of a hair metal song, but again, Carr knows exactly what its use is and it shreds in the moment it's used for. <laughs> Forty Five Grey formed in 1979 and actually broke up the same year this movie was released. Hopefully there was no correlation. One of the more punkier of the punk songs on the punk soundtrack has to go to the Dams track Deadbeat Dance, another track that fits the tone of the film oh so perfectly. The Damned were an English rock band formed in London in 1976 and were the first major Brit punk band to tour the United States. Badass guitar player Captain Sensible actually left the band soon after the film's release saying that the band was going too much in the gothic genre, which he apparently didn't like. They later became renounced for their gothic style punk rock, so clearly Captain Sensible had a point. <laughs> TSOL's Nothing For You didn't speak to the movie directly like some of the other ones did, but it's still one of the most punk rock tracks on the record. From Long Beach and formed in 1978, TSOL considered themselves in various genres of music, including death rock, art punk, and horror punk. Perfect for this soundtrack. What do you think this is all about? You think this is a fucking costume? This is a way of life. The best actual tried and true punk track on the album is The Flesh Eater's Eyes Without a Face. This song is awesome. It's fun, it's fast, and it's fucking punk rock as fuck. 
Formed in Los Angeles in 1977 by punk poet Krista Jardins, their music was distinctive for its apocalyptic film noir lyricism and its sophisticated arrangements. The band was much smarter than history gives them credit for. They were at their height in the mid-80s, so they were a given to be recruited for this film soundtrack. Every track on the record evokes the sense and fun of the film. It's crazy fun through and through. There's not a dull moment in this movie, and the music keeps it crazy and exciting. There's so many wonderful, crass, and deliberate moments in this movie that are all aided by the music that Carr set up for it. This movie, it's funny. It's a, it's a fucking funny movie. Hold him down now, hold him down. What are you gonna do? Oh! Leanne Quigley, a.k.a. Trash, does an awesome naked dance in a graveyard to her own self-titled theme, SSQ, and it's 80s glorious. I know these days that scene probably wouldn't exist, but in 1985, it was fun and wacky and amazing. I actually love the direction horror has taken, but films like James Gunn's Slither really stand out because they evoke the same sensibilities of something like Return of the Living Dead. And it also created so many of the zombie tropes that people think of from earlier zombie movies, like eating brains. What I also love is it just doesn't follow a certain set of rules. The zombies? Yeah, they run, they talk, they think shit out, and plan. So fucking what? It's a glorious piece of horror filmmaking, and the music has become more than just cult classic. I would think that modern day horror directors could only dream of catching the same fun, scares, gore, and grip of the zeitgeist of the genre. The original soundtrack from the film of the same name, released in 1985 by Enigma Records. The soundtrack has undergone numerous releases in different countries. A limited Grey Brains edition vinyl was released in 2016. You can find the original pressings on Discogs, and the 2016 Grey Brains edition pressings uh, supposedly on Amazon, but they may be all out of stock. For my Halloween vinyl recommendation, going a little different this time. We gotta get spooky, everybody. I'm going with A Horn Book for Witches. It's a bunch of ghost stories told by Vincent Price. A Horn Book for Witches. As always, thank you so much for watching, everyone. Watch it all through the month of October. After all, this is the month of Halloween. Let's get spooky, everyone. Thanks so much. We'll see you next time. Well, baby, your ass, fall, eat a hunting, the whole day.